from the ACLU, this is At Liberty. I'm Kendall Seesmeyer, your host. Another Supreme Court term has come to a close. This year, the court delivered major decisions on voting rights, free speech, indigenous sovereignty, and racial justice, among other issues. The ACLU was involved in cases throughout the term, and in many ways, our wins exceeded our expectations. However, in the last two days of the term, the court dropped decisions overturning affirmative action, codifying discrimination in the name of free speech, and blocking President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan. Here to help us reconcile our wins and losses and break down the term is returning favorite David Cole, the ACLU's National Legal Director. David, welcome back to At Liberty. Thanks for having me. So, David, this year's Supreme Court term has shaped up to be much less conservative than I think we all expected and feared. And it's very different from last year's term when we saw a whopping 13 losses, the most memorable being the Dobbs decision in June, which overturned Roe v. Wade. How would you describe the landscape of this term's uh, court compared to the last one? Well, I think, you know, we all expected a, a kind of replay of last term. We expected the court to overthrow precedent to accept uh, far-reaching conservative arguments across the board. It accepted for review a number of cases that raised really serious constitutional challenges to all sorts of programs that were seeking to further equality. Uh, And in the end, it was a mixed term, but a term in which uh, for example, the three liberal justices, Justices um, Sotomayor, uh, Jackson and Kagan, were in the majority more often than Justices Alito and Thomas, the court's two most conservative justices, and in which uh, they divided along six to three Republican-appointed versus Democratic-appointed justices' lines in only five or six cases out of uh, something like 60 uh, total cases. So um, it was a term in which the court seems to have Uh, walked it back a little bit, acted a little bit more like a court, uh, applied precedent rather than overturning precedent, uh, and um, reached many uh, surprising results um, as a consequence. So, yes, I I would agree with perhaps a few caveats, and we'll get into those caveats being the the losses that were hard to stomach and I think oftentimes didn't really follow precedent? No question. We are not celebrating, but we are we are breathing a sigh of relief. <laughs> That's a good good to note. Following the last term, we saw the Supreme Court reach its lowest public approval rating in recent history. And there was an overwhelming lack of confidence in the court's legitimacy. That was the analysis coming out of last term. I know that this is all conjecture, but the people want to know, do you think that that has any relevance as to how the court decided cases on this term? I think, yes, it does. I mean, you can't prove or disprove it. um, But, you know, historically, political scientists who've studied the court over the years have found that the court rarely parts company radically from where the country is on fundamental issues. And On the occasions when it does so, there is often a public response, a criticism of the court. The court loses its legitimacy and the court course corrects. Doesn't always happen immediately. Look, I think had folks not gone out in the streets, had folks not condemned the Dobbs decision, the the guns decision, the environmental decision, had people sort of said, well, you know, the Supreme Court has... uh, has the power to make these decisions, and it's made them, and we have to accept them. And uh, then I think this term would have looked a lot worse. And I do think when you look at the lineups, it appears that the court, whether consciously or unconsciously, and probably mostly unconsciously, sought to come up with areas of consensus and ways of deciding cases that allowed the court to avoid the impression that it's just six Republicans jamming their views down the country's throats uh, and instead is a, a court of justices who are 
try and apply the law, coming at it from very different worldviews that they start from, but bound by precedent and willing, in most cases, uh, to abide by that precedent. Yeah, I mean, I think especially after we saw the the draft opinion leak from last term, um, I imagine that even the ecosystem within who the people who are working alongside the justices, the justices themselves, like there, I imagine there had to be some level of, okay, we really have to clean up here um, and and work together. I want to talk about the losses first. These were decided at the very last two days of the term. Um, I think we were all holding our breath the entire month of June for these last two days so that we could see what was going to happen with these these big ones. So first we have 303 Creative Inc. versus Ellenis. This case concerns the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Act that had relevance in a similar dispute from 2018 involving Masterpiece Cake Shop in which the ACLU represented a same-sex couple who was refused service from a bakery they went for their wedding cake. Can you explain what was going on in this case? Who was involved and what was, what was the question really at the center of the case? Sure. So it was a replay of Masterpiece Cake Shop. This one involved a web designer. Her name was Lori Smith. She had a company called 303 Creative, and she claimed that she wanted to provide wedding website designs Uh, but she didn't want to provide them for same-sex weddings. And she sued. She had had never actually provided any wedding website designs, but she said, look, I want to do this under the Colorado law. If I provide wedding website designs for straight couples, I have to provide them for uh, gay couples. I oppose same-sex marriage, uh, and I should not be compelled to say something that uh, celebrates a same-sex marriage. And so she brought a case of essentially arguing for a First Amendment right to discriminate. Uh, that, that's the case. No gay couple came to her and asked for her services. She didn't turn anybody away. And the way we got involved in the case the last time around was we represented the party who had been discriminated against. Here, there was no such party, and that was by design. The Alliance Defending Freedom created this case. They characterized the case exactly as they wanted to. And they didn't want to have a victim because a victim uh, shows the harms that are, that, are, that are caused by this kind of conduct. And so they, they presented it really as an abstract question to the court. And, you know, the last time around, the court ultimately ducked deciding the question. But in, in, in writing its opinion, it said very clearly the fact that a business has a philosophical or religious objection to serving people equally does not give it a right to discriminate under general non-discrimination laws. Generally, the court has said, where the government's interest is not in the speech, but rather a neutral interest in prohibiting some conduct that's problematic, uh, that law will be upheld even if it has an incidental effect on uh, expression in those instances where, you know, expression is involved. Um, so that's what they had said. In this case, they flip that and they say expression is involved. She shouldn't have to uh, say she uh, celebrates same-sex marriage. The government can't compel her to do so under, you know, any way, shape, or form. And it doesn't matter that the law is neutral. It doesn't matter that the government's interest is not in controlling speech. All that matters is that her business provides customized expressive services and she objects. And that wins out over all of the equality uh, uh, concerns that have always won out in the past. Very disturbing result. Extremely disturbing. And, I mean, it really feels like a random carve-out that they... Found. I think of this similarly to how abortion bans used to be when Roe was law. Um, the, the kind of like random chipping away um, at something that had existed that had provided access. And, and this in, in, in the same way, it feels like this, like, okay, when it is artistic, when it's expressive, when it's customized, you can discriminate because that implicates free speech. Um, 
uh, it's, it's really troubling. What kind of behavior will this make way for? What What do you imagine will come from this decision? So, you know, I, I think only time will tell. Uh, and in part, you know, the stronger the norms against discriminating are, the less likely businesses are going to violate those norms because, you know, right. it undermines their business. So it's likely to to apply only to those who have very strong uh, views. But the opinion is, is pretty poorly written and reasoned. And so it's a little unclear, for example, what constitutes a customized expressive business. When we argued Masterpiece Cake Shop, uh, the court asked the same lawyer who was representing Masterpiece, represented 303, they asked her, you know, what about, um, you know, nail salons? What about makeup artists? They're artists. It's customized. It's really um, unclear how broadly this decision will uh, will apply. I think Alliance Defending Freedom, which is the organization that brought Masterpiece, it's an anti-gay group. It uses First Amendment rights to try to undermine gay rights claims, will seek to uh, apply it broadly. We will be in there seeking to um, uh, read it as, uh, read it very narrowly. And I think there are some ways to read it narrowly, and uh, uh, but only time will tell. I want to turn to another decision that we received on the same day as 303 Creative. Um, we also received two decisions that kind of coupling here in cases regarding uh, President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan. This was Department of Education versus Brown and Biden versus Nebraska. Can you explain what was at stake in these cases and what the court decided? So the, the, the question was whether President Biden had the authority to essentially excuse uh, a significant amount of student loans for um, uh, many, many uh, people who have these debts hanging over their heads. And um, the challengers argued that the statute that he cited in providing this benefit wasn't specific enough in authorizing mm -hmm. him to grant this for particular form of relief. It was a statute that said you could sort of um, delay uh, payment of uh, student loans during periods of emergency. And he, in fact, used it earlier to do precisely that. Mm -hmm. uh, but they said uh, it, 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 it's reading it too far to read it to authorize the forgiveness of those um, student loans. It's $400 billion uh, worth of, you know, U.S. Treasury uh, monies. And uh, Congress should be more specific about authorizing that kind of effectively an expenditure um, uh, than it was in uh, in the in this statute, the court applied the what they call the major questions doctrine. It's the same they they, they first applied it last year in the case involving whether the EPA could require um, electrical power producers to shift to more to greener sources of energy. Um, and what the court basically said there was, you know, yes, the EPA was given some fairly broad authority back in the day. But what it's doing now is new, it's different, uh, it's, it's big, it's, you know, would be uh, very costly. And so Congress, we are going to require that Congress be much more specific about authorizing these kinds of activities. And, you know, that, that's, a, that's a doctrine that the court just made up. It was, mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's a doctrine that essentially lets them avoid applying statutes as they are written uh, and instead say, well, even though it's written in a way that could be read to authorize this action, we're going to require Congress to be much more explicit, to be much more clear when we decide that a particular action is new and big. Um, very, very, so it's a very uh, slippery um, doctrine, particularly from a court that claims to be very literalist and textualist, and we just apply what Congress says. Well, you know, now we're saying, no, oh, but except when we think Congress hasn't been specific enough and the problem is big enough and we don't like the program enough, then mm. then we will um, uh, we will override the statute and say it's it's not sufficient. 
I also like to make up rules for my own benefit. Um, Always useful, especially, just, especially if nobody has the power to review your own rules. Exactly. That's quite interesting. Do you think that there's a way to get a different version of the student loan forgiveness plan passed or allowed by the court? Or is it just inevitable that any loan forgiveness plan whatsoever that the Biden administration tries to implement will get challenged and therefore end up with the same fate? Well, I expect that they'll be challenged. I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that he will try again. Um, he's <laughs> right. already said that he will try again. And, and the, they have other authorities that they think justify this. Uh, you know, it, it's it's. I don't think it's a great political issue for the Republicans to be against giving, uh, you know, get, uh, giving a break to to uh, you know a lot of low income people who can't pay off their uh, student loans. It, it affects a lot of people. That's a you know a lot of votes. So I think at some point we might get there, but um, the Supreme Court's not has you know has made it much harder. Got it. Yeah, I mean, it's an entire generation of people. It seems. Yeah. Yeah. I want to wrap up the conversation on the cases we lost with a decision that also regards higher education. You know where we're going here. Um, this was about affirmative action, and we have two cases, Students for Fair Admissions versus President and Fellows of Harvard College and Students for Fair Admissions versus the University of North Carolina. We did a more in-depth rapid response episode on, on the decision when it was first issued last week, so people can check that out. But... Um, can you give us a, a broad overview on what the court ruled here? So the court essentially ruled that the justification that had been accepted for 45 years for considering race as uh, one factor in a kind of holistic assessment of an individual uh, applying to college namely diversity. We want a diversity of viewpoints, a diversity of experiences. The educational benefits of diversity are significant, uh, and race is part of that diversity. Uh, the court basically said that rationale is not sufficient to justify using mm. race as a, uh, uh, even as a, you know, one factor among many. And, and they essentially argued that the um, diversity is too amorphous. How do you know when a when a student body is sufficiently diverse? How do you measure the benefits of diversity? And since you can't measure them, uh, it's very hard to sort of ask when is enough enough. And therefore, um, uh, the ex they they held the explicit use of race um, cannot can, can will no longer be accepted. They I mean they also pointed out that. You know, any consideration of race as a plus factor for one person is by definition a negative factor for another because uh, ap applying to college is a zero-sum game. You know, that's true, but it's, of course, it's, you know, it's seeking to aid those who have been excluded historically right. from these very institutions. You know, they have in other contexts, they have accepted compelling interests that are every bit as amorphous as diversity. In one case, uh, about a de decade ago, they held that the upholding the integrity of the courts is a compelling interest. Well, how do you measure the integrity of the courts? You know, you, so so it's so it's a little um, disingenuous to say diversity can't be measured. Therefore, it's not a legitimate interest. It's um, it's difficult to measure, to be sure, but it's surely an important um, uh, interest. I, the, the one saving grace I'll say is that the court closes its opinion by saying nothing in this opinion precludes an applicant from talking about uh, his or her race in an essay in which she he or she links it to some quality or characteristic that is relevant mm -hmm. to uh, admissions to the university. And so I think mm -hmm. you're going to see a lot of... So essentially, they say you still can consider race as long as it's considered in this narrow, particularized way. Um, and so, you know, we'll see how much that really, at the end of the day, makes a difference. Uh, schools are also able to use race-neutral measures. A number of justices made clear they're not calling into question using, like, socioeconomic status as an example where, uh, you know, you, you, you give people a leg up because they come from 
uh, poverty or, um, and, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, in our country, that's uh, disproportionately people of color. And, uh, and so that will have an effect of increasing racial diversity as well as increasing socioeconomic diversity. So, you know, I, I think it remains to be seen how, how devastating this is going to be. Um, mm-hmm. um, and it will depend to some extent on how committed universities are to looking for alternative legal avenues to ensure that underrepresented groups are in fact represented uh, in, in their institutions. That was a really, really thorough overview, and you answered many of my questions. But one thing I did want to note was um, a quote that, from your piece that you just published in the New York Review of Books. You write, the real division between the majority and the dissenters in the affirmative action cases lies in their approach to the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. The majority reads it to require color blindness and therefore to call into question any consideration of race, even those designed to ameliorate inequality. Now, if we think back to why the 14th Amendment was written in the first place, was it not to ameliorate racial inequality? This seems like such a departure from a group of people who, again, are textualists, abide by an originalist interpretation of the Constitution. Um, am I missing something here? No. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's cer- certainly the 14th Amendment was adopted uh, with a specific goal of uh, aiding uh, newly freed slaves and 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 fighting the uh, the discrimination that everyone knew would continue, um, right. even though th- even with the end of of slavery, and it was a recognition that um, in order to achieve equality for a group that had been enslaved for so long, uh, formal equality uh, was not sufficient, and that you know efforts to aid the newly freed slaves were not unconstitutional, whereas efforts to continue to subjugate and subordinate them were unconstitutional. Right. So it's not a kind of, um, you know, um, uh, neutral principle that you can't look at race. It's a, a principle that says race has been used in this country for particularly uh, uh, pernicious reasons with particular victims. Uh, and sometimes we need to take race into account in order to uh, in order to adjust for to remedy uh, that past discrimination. And I think that is really where the dissenters and the majority party company, the dissenters view mm-hmm. view the 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 Fourteenth Amendment as concerned about substantive equality, about real equality, whereas the majority sees it about as being about formal equality or colorblindness, which, and even if formal equality and colorblindness leads to the continuing uh, subordinate status of a group, uh, of a racial group in this country, the, the the majority says, well, that's, you know, that's just, so, the, be, it. so be it. Wild. With that, I want to move to some of our wins. Um, and, and particularly these, a lot of these cases included the conception of race. Um, and one that, you know, I think came as a surprise to many, I don't even know if we had prepared for a win, was the decision in Brackeen versus Holland. This case concerned a law passed by Congress in 1978 called the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, tell us about, so in, in the end, um, the court ended up deciding to affirm the Indian Child Welfare Act, which again, was not something that we anticipated. Um, what were we particularly worried about in this case, and and what what does it have to do with racial justice? Because um, I think the the very kind of tricky way that race was included as a consideration in this case is is really interesting yeah. and troubling. Yeah. So just um, as we're switching to the cases we won, I think big picture, it's worth sort of reminding folks we won we won more than we lost this term, and a lot more than we lost. So the last term. Uh, As you said at the outset, um, in cases that we filed briefs in, the court sided with our side only five times 
in mostly minor cases that no one ever heard of, uh, and against us in 13 cases. We lost mm-hmm. 13 cases, and almost all of those by six to three votes. This term, we won 11 cases uh, and lost seven. And many of the victories were in the biggest cases of the term. I mean, some of the losses were in the big cases as well. We just finished talking about them. But many of the victories were in really significant civil rights cases. So um, so when you stand back, big picture, actually, although the last two days we had these three very consequential losses, uh, in fact, the term was uh, was a pretty good one for civil rights and civil liberties. And I'll say this way better than anybody, literally anybody predicted at the beginning of the term. Uh, I think what we've seen here is some reversion to the mean, some uh, recognition that the court has to act like a court and not like a political body, that law restricts the options it has, et cetera. And, um, and Brackeen is an example of that because this was an extraordinarily broad challenge to the Indian Child Welfare Act. They challenged it under the a, a commerce clause. Congress didn't have the authority to enact it. They challenged it under the Tenth Amendment. Congress can't require states to um, uh, to, to to carry out the the requirements of the act. They challenged it as a violation of the delegation doctrine. They challenged it under the equal protection clause. They said it was mm-hmm. race discrimination because one part of it said that when you're figuring out where uh, you know where a kid gets ends up who's who's taken from his family, um, you give preference to family members and also to members of the same tribe. And the uh, challengers said that was um, race discrimination. But it really was a sort of it was a, like a class in constitutional law all in itself, this case, because it had mm. so many constitutional challenges. And most people thought, the Indian Child Welfare Act, one of the few positive pieces of federal legislation that seeks to affirm Native American rights, um, would go down. And in fact, uh, it was upheld uh, seven to two. Justice uh, Amy Coney Barrett, Trump's last appointee, wrote the opinion. Uh, Only Alito and Thomas dissented. Justice Gorsuch wrote a, a ringing concurrence talking about how the the, the 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 historic abuses that had been laid at the feet of Native American peoples in this country. Uh, and, um, you know, the Indian Child Welfare Act survives. Now, I will say the one caveat here is that the court ultimately did not reach the equal protection challenge. It held that the plaintiffs lacked standing to raise those claims. And in some other case, uh, some plaintiffs will have standing and the court will reach them. So, you know, we live to fight another day, but on, they rejected all the other challenges. And yeah, it was a, it was a shock to, I think, everybody um, who was, again, expecting the worst because last term we saw the worst, you know, in, the, in cases like Dobbs and Bruin, the guns case. And everyone expected we would see more of the same. And we didn't in that case. I want to move on to voting rights as we kind of tick through the wins here. Um, This was the other kind of surprising group of wins. Um, We had two voting rights cases that we were involved in this term, one being Allen versus Milligan, which we've also called Milligan versus Merrill, um, and then one being Moore versus Harper. I want to start with Allen versus Milligan. Um, This a uh, case dealt with Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and it was a, a case that called into question um, racial redistricting or the ability for states to draw maps that would essentially dilute or completely um, erase the voting power of of Black voters, in this case, Black Alabamians. What was the decision? And then what was your reaction to the decision in this case? Yeah, so um, we were overjoyed to win this case. We, uh, we, won, we won this case in the lower courts unanimously. Um, and we, uh, but when the, but the Supreme Court stayed our victory, which meant that the you know, 2022 election went, went along with a map that the courts had held was illegal, uh, and it didn't look good. You know, it looked like the court would overturn our victory. And in fact, they affirmed our victory. And it's, it's critically important. This, 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 this statute, the Voting Rights Act, was enacted 
with the recognition that uh, legislatures in drawing maps can can um, break up communities in such a way that they really disenfranchise folks. You know, you take a minority group and you put, you know, a few in one district and a few in another district and a few in another district, and they are a small minority in each of these districts. And if you've got a state where racially polarized voting is endemic, where white people vote one way and black people vote another way, um, and a state where there's been uh, discrimination, what Congress said was, in those situations, we don't want to let legislatures disenfranchise minority voters by cracking them up into all these districts. And so where you can show that there's racially polarized voting, where you can show that there's other evidence of race discrimination in political in the political system, and you can show that the state could create a majority minority district where minority voters are sufficiently numerous that they have an opportunity to elect candidates of their choice, you're required to do so. And we showed that in Alabama, they could create two majority black districts. That would give uh, two out of seven uh, uh, for their congressional delegation. That would give them roughly the proportional representation in Congress that they that they are in among the voting age population in Alabama. And the courts uh, court below uh, applying existing law said we won. Uh, this and uh, the Supreme Court um, was asked to basically overturn existing law to uh, hold that the only time a state has violated the Voting Rights Act is when it when you can prove that it intentionally singled out people because of their race and sought to deny them their um, their right to vote. Very, very hard to, to prove uh, uh, that. And uh, they argued that we, sh- we should have to show that an additional majority-minority district can, can be drawn without any consideration of race whatsoever. We have to sort of close our eyes to reality <laughs> and somehow come up with this new map. And the court um, uh, rejected those arguments, affirmed our result, and that will mean that Alabama will now have two districts uh, in which uh, African Americans will have an opportunity to elect candidates of their choice. But it will also mean that a number of other southern states in which we are litigating similar challenges, um, we are likely to um, get additional districts for minority voters in those country in those uh, in those states as well. So it's a uh, it would have been a devastating loss, and it was a huge victory. And will those new districts in Alabama, when will they uh, be reassigned? Well, I think the, essentially starting now, uh, I mean, the, the cases will go back to the lower court. Then the, the legislature has to come up with a new map, and then the court will assess whether that map is sufficient or not. So there may well be, there all, almost always is follow-on litigation um, but the court made clear that, you know, Congress meant what it said and the court's not going to uh, undermine, at least in this instance, what Congress said. Um, so, um, you know, super important victory for um, for voting rights, for the for the representation of minority um, populations in uh, in in legislatures across this across this nation. And I think it's worth noting that this this decision was given just around the same time as we mark the 10th anniversary of Shelby versus Holder, which was one of the most devastating blows to the Voting Rights Act that we've seen. Um, That decision struck down provisions for Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which forced states and localities with an established record of racial discriminating voting practices to seek federal approval before changing their voting laws. Um, The the repercussions of Shelby versus Holder unleashed a torrent of voter suppression measures and other discriminating voting laws nationwide. Um, And so I think in context of weighing, looking at this decision in Allen versus Milligan, um, given marking this other anniversary, it even feels bigger. The win feels bigger, perhaps. Well, it does. So it certainly doesn't make up for, you know, the elimination of Section 5, which was the single most right. single most useful uh, provision in the Voting Rights Act. But had they 
essentially denuded Section 2 of any meaning, there would be virtually nothing left of the Voting Rights Act. So they preserved uh, this critically uh, you know, important protection. And it was Roberts who wrote Shelby County uh, who also wrote um, uh, Allen versus Milligan. So, you know, again, that's a, some sign of a reflection that the court is, at least some members of the court are, 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 are thinking about the institutional role of the court as much, you know, as what they, what they would do if they, you know, were just voting on their own, on their own preferences. And is, isn't that kind of what we know Roberts to do? Yeah, he is genuinely someone who has demonstrated a real concern for the institutional legitimacy of the court and um, for seeking to avoid partisan uh, divides where where possible. Uh, you know, he wouldn't have overturned Roe versus Wade, for example. Um, Notable. You know, five, five justices said to overturn it, that was enough. But he said no, he would have uh, reached a, a, a less... Um, a less radical result. And, you know, Shelby County was not a, you know, was, was maybe not an institutionalist decision, but that was sort of way back when. And, and I think he has become more institutionalist as the, mm. you know, as the kind of legitimacy of the court has been more called into question. Great. <laughs> We're going to move on to Moore versus Harper, which was another voting rights case one that could could have upended democratic elections. Um, it deals with a concept called the independent state legislature theory, which um, we talked about in the preview of this case. David, can you give us a little bit of a sense of what the independent state legislature theory is and how it related to Moore versus Harper? Yeah, so this is a case in which um, the North Carolina legislature controlled by Republicans, enacted what the North Carolina Supreme Court called an extreme partisan gerrymander in which they, you know, drew the drew, drew the lines so that Republicans had very, very strong, safe seats in a much bigger proportion of the legislative districts than their, than their share in the statewide population vote um, uh, really you know, uh, would have warranted. And the state, North Carolina Supreme Court said that the North Carolina state legislature violated the North Carolina Constitution in doing that. Partisan gerrymanders mm-hmm. violate the North Carolina Constitution. You know, that would have been the end of the story, except the Republican legislators went to the U.S. Supreme Court and said, actually, the U.S. Supreme Court, the U.S. Constitution bars a North Carolina Supreme Court from imposing any limits on the North Carolina legislature in creating the rules for congressional elections because there's a provision in the Constitution that says it's the legislature of each state that shall set the rules for congressional elections. And they say it says legislature. It doesn't say state. It says legislature. And and here the legislature set the rules. And then the court, the court said that the legislature violated the, the state constitution in in uh, in doing so. And so they basically argued state legislatures, at least for purposes of setting the rules and drawing the maps for congressional elections, are above their own state constitution. They are not constrained by their state constitution at all. Um, and the Supreme Court uh, and and a number of justices on the court had had adopted this view, you know, in dissents and and in various other sort of opinions along the way. The court had never adopted this view, uh, but in this case, the court squarely rejected the view and said, "No, state legislatures are creatures of their own state constitutions, and so they're bound by their own state constitutions." And with the fact that the framers gave legislatures the authority to draft the rules doesn't mean that the uh, framers of the U.S. Constitution wanted to place those legislatures above the constitutions that actually created them in the first place. So, mm. um, and this is hugely important, not only because um, you know state uh, constitutions are one of the only you know arguments we can make to challenge partisan gerrymanders, given that the Supreme Court has said that the federal constitution doesn't uh, address these uh, issues, but also because you know, if you think about all the political gamesmanship uh, that occurred after the 20, uh, uh, 20 election and when President Trump was trying to challenge the results of the election, 
you know, you can imagine a, a, a state legislature controlled by the party of the, you know, who lost the presidential election trying to muck around with the rules uh, in ways that would uh, help their, their candidate. So hugely important decision uh, for democracy going forward. Beautiful. I do want to continue on um, and talk about other cases that we saw. Um, I want to talk about just very briefly the free speech case in United States versus Hansen, which was our case. The court ruled to limit the scope of a federal immigration law that threatened free speech rights. The court ruled that the government cannot criminalize speech that merely encourages a non-citizen to enter or stay in the U.S. Um, unlawful. Can you talk about United States versus Hansen, why we ended up taking up this case on our side, and uh, and how we feel about the decision? So um, Hansen involved a federal law that on its face made it a crime to provide any encouragement to a non-documented person to remain in the country unlawfully. Uh, and there are you know, millions of people here unlawfully. And um, you know, they are encouraged to stay here by grandmothers who don't want their grandchildren to go home, by lawyers who um, advise their clients that they're better off uh, if they stay here in terms of their uh, ability to pursue their legal claims, by social workers who provide assistance to folks who are uh, indigent but uh, undocumented. Uh, and, and we argued that, that if the law were applied that broadly, uh, it would be unconstitutional. The court um, ultimately held that the law could not be applied that broadly and that it was narrowly limited to situations in which somebody intentionally solicits someone to engage in a specific crime or aids and abets that person in um, in providing a uh, in, in engaging in a specific crime, and so it's an important limitation on this statute, which otherwise um, uh, was very very broad, uh, uh, limiting it to the kinds of speech soliciting crime that has long been unprotected under the Constitution. And had this statute been applied uh, in? In practice, I mean, it, it does sound incredibly broad. Um, what, what were we seeing uh, before this decision? So it, had, it hadn't been, there, there, there had been you know, a few instances where people were investigated. There was one where someone uh, was, was um, charged with telling her nanny uh, to stay. Uh, um, but um, by and large, it was fairly rarely prosecuted. But the government had been arguing in its prosecutions that it was an extraordinarily broad statute, that all they had to prove was encouragement. They didn't have to prove this intentional solicitation of a specific crime. Um, and so um, what's important is that the, the court really narrowed the meaning of the statute so the government won't be tempted to apply it more broadly. And as long as it was out there um, and the government was arguing that it was as broad as it was, many people were chilled in their ability to, you know, um, uh, work with uh, members of the of the undocumented community by the f this mm -hmm. kind of fear that they could be prosecuted. One other quick thing I wanted to note before we, we move on and say goodbye is the Peltier versus Chartered Day School case in which the Supreme Court actually decided to not take up this case and instead let stand a federal court holding that a North Carolina public charter school must respect its students' constitutional rights, which were previously violated by a skirts-only rule for girls. This is a major win for students in North Carolina's public charter schools, but what significance, if any, will this victory hold for students nationwide? Well, I think it um, it establishes that when a state seeks to provide public education through charter schools, um, those charter schools are bound by the Constitution, just like traditional, you know, district schools are. Mm -hmm. uh, and North Carolina had argued that no, uh, or at least the charter, the charter school had argued no. It's 
Um, it's not, it's, it's run by a private corporation and shouldn't be bound by the Constitution in respecting its students' rights. And it was supported in its petition to the Supreme Court uh, um, by a, uh, a many, uh, a, a wealth of charter school associations across the country and a number of states who argued that, uh, no, these schools should be treated as private and therefore not bound mm. by the Constitution. So, um, you know, the, the court denying cert itself doesn't have um, precedential effect, but it leaves in place the lower court decision, which is a very powerful decision about the um, importance of holding these public charter schools accountable to the same constitutional constraints that apply to uh, all other um, public schools. And given the, you know, the burgeoning of charter schools, um, this could have been a really, really huge loophole in constitutional protections for students, whether it be dress codes or speech codes. Very good. A lot of powerful work um, that we've been talking about done this year, David. What are you most proud of? I'm just proud every day of um, the folks on our teams who are in the courts fighting uh, for um you know, to, to fighting the forces of evil and fighting to um, protect vulnerable folks. I mean, and, and you know, the, a lot of these cases never get to the Supreme Court. So, you know, mm-hmm. but we've now had a, a string of victories in these in challenges to these limits on gender affirming care. We've had victories in state courts protecting um, women's access uh, to abortion. We've had um, victories in state and federal courts, um, striking down voter suppression measures and challenging unfair uh, uh, districting maps. And all of that, you know, makes our country a, a better country, protects those who um, who are targeted for political reasons by, uh, you know, the, the majority in, in one particular jurisdiction or another, uh, and, you know, allows us to have a constitution that actually means something on the ground isn't just a uh, you know some words on paper but actually means something on the ground and it's only because of organizations like the ACLU and you know the people who support us that the those words actually are meaningful and you know I'm proud of that because I think at the end of the day it's that that you know preserves our constitutional protections as much or more than the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is, as we've seen, uh, somewhat constrained by the political forces and uh, can't mm-hmm. do whatever it wants to do. But we have to be part of those political forces that are pushing for the protection of civil rights and civil liberties for the improvement of, you know, dig- equal equality and dignity and privacy and the like um, for our people. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much for joining us yet again. Um, it's always fun to to come together after the term and um, assess what has gone on. Um, fun might not be the word. <laughs> I was going to say. It's always interesting. Yeah. It's always interesting. Uh, and I really appreciate your candor and also your ability to help break down some of these decisions for us in record time. Well, thank you, Kendall. And yeah, it's not always fun, but it was more fun this term than last term when That's uh, true. all we had to do was <laughs> complain. So um, you know, yeah. be thankful for small favors. Very true. All right. Well, thank you for your time, David. We'll look forward to doing this again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to At Liberty wherever you get your podcasts and rate and review the show. We really appreciate the feedback. At Liberty is a production of the ACLU, produced by me, Kendall Seesmeyer, and Vanessa Handy. This episode was edited by Matt Boynton. Lila Sheridan is our intern. Until next week, stay strong.